Good afternoon and welcome to SCA International's quarterly webinar. Um, today we're going to be going over OSHA compliance for finishing contractors. Um, before we get started, a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, my name is Drew Page. I am the FCA liaison to the uh, Safety Advisory Committee and also Director of Operations at Optimum Safety Management. Um, FCA is building a better future for our families and uh, Optimum's vision is workers everywhere valued and safe. I think those two um, go hand in hand together, but I have been uh, managing safety and health for the last 10 years and um, excited to be bringing you today's quarterly webinar. So just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, if you do have any questions during this webinar, uh, please direct them to the safety helpline. You can either call at the number you're seeing on the screen uh, or email um, at the email safety helpline at finishingcontractors.org. Everybody will be muted during this webinar um, to keep down the background noise and we will not have time at the end for questions. However, the safety helpline is always available to you guys, um, not only after today's presentation, if you have questions, if you would like a copy of the presentation, just email the safety helpline at finishingcontractors.org. But also after today, um, upcoming weeks, upcoming months, if you have any questions pertaining to safety, uh, please call in email, we'd love to help you out and steer you in the right direction. Additionally, during today's webinar, you will be seeing um, some of these toolbox talks. So FCA has a toolbox talk program that's avail available to all members. All you have to do is call an email uh, and ask to get a login and you can have a login to over 200 toolbox talks, both English and Spanish. There's also some 52 week toolbox talk preset schedules available for you. Um, but you'll be seeing some of these uh, as examples for today's webinar. Um, and if you were with us last year, we did the OSHA top 10 um, and we're gonna be looking at that again. So there's some things that have changes, changed some similarities, but we're definitely gonna be looking at that today uh, and getting a refresher on there. So let's start off with looking back the last 10 years on OSHA's enforcement. So you're seeing the total inspections has trickled downward a little bit in the last 10 years, which is pretty interesting um, because on the surface, I would have thought that this was going in the upward direction because uh, you just have heard the last eight years compliance has been up, up, up. Um, well, statistically, that's not the case. So these are federal OSHA inspections, so that's about half the country, gives us a good data point on um, how everything's being run. Also, it's pretty interesting that total violations over the last 10 years have also dropped. So, not to point that out, um, to say that we can get away with things, we still definitely need to be compliant. OSHA is still out there, um, you know, 60,000, about 60,000 violations last year. That's a lot of violations. So. Um, we're still exposed being on construction sites. OSHA could just be driving by, see we're doing something wrong and they can stop and we're open to some of these citations. But pretty interesting that uh, this is going in the downward direction. Additionally, it's pretty interesting how OSHA is coming about doing their inspections. So um, there's two main buckets, programmed inspections, those which would be local emphasis programs, also, national emphasis programs, those would be a programmed inspection. So they're expecting to do certain inspections. Unprogrammed in inspections are ones that, you know, they get a complaint or a referral. They're not planning on it, but as they come in, they're going to see these job sites uh, or work sites and uh, doing inspections. So you can see here, uh, the last 10 years, we had a flip-flop in 2015 versus programmed and unprogrammed inspections where the bulk of them are. So we went from 60-40 programmed, unprogrammed, and now we're having 60% of the inspections are actually unprogrammed inspections. Starting in 2015, this flipped. Why? There's a new requirement in 2015 um, that includes uh, 
any one person that is admitted to the hospital or prior before that it was three or more. So if one person's admitted to the hospital, if someone loses an eye, ha receives an amputation, um, we must call those in to OSHA. If we don't call those into OSHA and report them, OSHA finds out there's some hefty penalties. So most of the times those result to OSHA coming out and doing an inspection. So you can see why that has gone in that upward direction. So pretty interesting. So we definitely want to have good compliance. Uh, so we're avoiding OSHA citations, but we want to have good safety program training and measures in place so employees aren't getting injured, right? We want to make sure that they're going home to their families every day. Um, if the injury is severe, uh, where they're admitted to the hospital, you have to actually report that to OSHA. You're going to have an OSHA inspection, most likely some citations. So um, some things to be considering. Also, the last 10 years, this is about the same year over year. So about 75% of inspections every year um, or of the citations issued uh, are serious, 21% other than serious. So um, something that's more of a program, programmatic uh, citation or like a record keeping citation where someone isn't gonna get hurt as a result, that would be other than serious. Uh, repeat violations account for about 4% and then willful for about 2%. So um, definitely don't want to be in that 2% category. So OSHA comes out to your workplace and you're receiving them being a violation, 75% chance it's going to be a serious violation. Um, unless you've vitalized that standard within the last five years, then it will be a repeat. Okay, just because enforcement statistically seems to be dropping, um, we throw this in the mix. And uh, in 2016, actually, this um, was announced in 2015, but took effect in 2016, is our, uh, our citation penalties for per violation has gone up. So uh, for 25 years, they never increased this. And in 2016, they retroactively adjusted it so about 78 percent increase and then year after year it'll continue to rise so currently we're looking at a little over twelve and a half thousand dollars per serious other than serious and posting requirement violations uh willful or repeat could be a maximum of 126,000 and some change there so i just kind of projected out what will this be in 2027 this is just going to keep growing so um we may have a slight decline in uh, OSHA inspections. However, every citation is, uh, um, you know, going to be doubled here in 10 years. So that's something to consider. So we definitely want to have our compliance in order. Okay, so some important compliance dates that are coming up. Uh, this is very important. September 23rd, 2017, OSHA will begin enforcing the new silica standard for construction. So the original date of enforcement was pushed back three months uh, to the September 23rd. Um, doesn't mean that we need to start our compliance activities or be compliant by that date. OSHA would expect that we're already compliant to the new silica standard. And if you're sitting there saying, what the heck's this new silica standard um, might be uh, a bad situation for you. So anytime we're creating any kind of silica dust, we definitely need to have an assessment. Where is the silica dust coming from? What activities are we doing that are creating the silica dust? Are these activities on table one? If so, comply to table one, engineering and PPE controls. Also put a worker exposure control plan in place, which uh, is pretty much like a silica JHA. Make sure all your employees are trained. You have competent people uh, supervising the work. Uh, if your activities are not on table one, you have to actually do air monitoring. Uh, according to your air monitoring, wherever the results lie, maybe you're sending people to go get medical screening. Um, additionally, we're doing respir respiratory training. Uh, so there's a lot going on here. So September 23rd, this is kicking in. Um, I do have a hyperlink to the silica standard for construction webinar that we did um, a couple quarters ago. 
um, two or three quarters ago. So uh, this training, if you uh, email the safety helpline, it will uh, come with this link and link you right to there for more information. Um, November 10th, 2017, uh, this was the compliance date for crane operator certification. This also includes employees that are operating um, truck mounted cranes to deliver, let's say like drywall. Um, so a couple provisions there uh, that you may be interested in looking into, but November 10th was the compliance date. This date has been pushed back multiple times. May of this year, they announced that it intends to propose a new extension date. Uh, no word of that yet. And uh, December 1st of 2017 uh, is the deadline to electronically submit um, your OSHA Form 300A logs for 2016. The, the website went live uh, July 1st of this year. That was originally the first due date, um, but since they didn't have the website ready, uh, they pushed it to December 1st. Um, I went on the website yesterday and it did give me a red error message that said the site was having some technical difficulties. So I don't know if it's being bombed out with people trying to register and submit logs, but this is for establishments with 20 employees or over. So if you don't have at least 20 employees working for you, and that would mean you hit that number 20 uh, in March, um, you fall under this, okay? Um, just because you don't have 20 employees currently on your payroll, once you hit 20 employees in a year, um, this would apply to you. If you're under that, it doesn't. Everyone else, it does. So, um, and then you see for 250 and more employees, uh, we owe more electronic submittals uh, in 2018. So that's coming up here December 1st. So be looking out for those dates. Make sure they're on your calendar. Make sure you're ready for those. All right, moving on here. Uh, let's take a look at the OSHA top 10 most frequently cited violations for building finishing contractors. So um, this is definitely narrowed down uh, through the NAICS code. Uh, you see that up there. So all finishing contractors, this is your top 10 ranking. Uh, we did this last year, last August. Um, some of these have flip flop. We got a couple new ones here, um, but here's the point. If you, Whatever you're doing for your safety program currently, definitely if it's nothing, here's 10 places to start looking at and focusing on, okay? Um, if you have a great safety program, which many of you guys already do, uh, here's 10 items to make sure that you are totally have up to snuff because these are the top 10 cited. OSHA comes on your site, job site, chances are you could get cited for one of these because uh, this is what's on their radar. This is our most exposure. You can see number one, scaffolds, general requirements. Yeah, we're on scaffolding all the time. There's a lot of requirements there. Uh, fall protection, the duty to have fall protection, respiratory protection. Number four is aerial lifts. Five, hazard communication. Six is ladders. Then we go into uh, uh, lead requirements. So that's number seven. Uh, eight, I group these together, uh, fall protection and scaffolding training. Absolutely. So we're seeing fall protection and scaffolding on here a couple times. Number nine, fall protection, the systems, criteria, and practices. And then town, 10 rounds us out with uh, um, eye and face protection. So we're going to hit all of these today at this webinar. Uh, we're going to hit the highlights on them. There's a lot, a lot um, involved in all of these standards. These are the highlights, okay? So let's look at um, our number one most cited, which is scaffolds, the general requirements section. So this is broken down into capacity, scaffold platform construction, criteria for supported and suspended scaffolds, how are we accessing them, the proper way to use scaffolding, fall protection requirements, and falling object protection. So that's all encompassed in this 1926-451 for general requirements. So some of the th highlights here. First and foremost, do you have a competent person on site? If you're using scaffolding, you have to have a competent person on site. 
Um, what is a competent person, right? They have the knowledge and authority to correct issues. They have the training and experience and understanding to um, see hazards or predict hazards, okay? Um, the big thing is they have the authority from you to take corrective action. So competent person, that's huge. Uh, capacity, must support at least four times its intended load. Absolutely, including employees, tools, material, um, scaffold platforms, these are a big one. Um, scaffold grade planks. Personally, I like the I like the prefabricated platforms that clip right onto the scaffolding. Then we don't have to worry about scaffold grade planks and gaps and that sort of thing. Um, but if your operation doesn't allow for that or you don't have that type of scaffolding, definitely make need to make sure the overlapping is compliant. Um, the big thing is it's fully planked. A lot of times we see, you know, uh, the scaffold should have, I don't know, six planks on it and there's only two or three. You know, there's there's multiple gaps someone can fall through. Um, OSHA doesn't like to see anything greater than one inch. So um, if you have a one to two foot gap in there, that's that's definitely no good. Someone's going to fall and definitely get hurt. Uh, what is the what is the base? Right. So we can't just go straight onto the ground, straight onto the dirt, straight onto the concrete. We have to have the mud sills and the plates in place. Uh, our guardrails. Uh, anytime we're working on scaffolding 10 feet or greater, we must have guardrails in place. Now, a lot of general contractors will, will require um, six foot or greater for everything. They don't care what the OSHA standard says. They don't care that you're on a scaffolding. Their rule is six foot fall hazard all the time. Uh, you must have guardrails or some kind of fall protection. So something to be looking looking into. Um, and then, you know, how are we supporting the scaffolding once it becomes four times greater um, than the smallest dimension? At that point, um, we have a, a tip hazard and OSHA is requiring us to tie and brace this uh, so it doesn't tip. Again, some general contractors, you need to check who you're working for, might lower that requirement to from four times to three times. So, um they're going to be extra cautious, have extra safety precautions in place, so uh, that tipping doesn't occur. Um, you know, the four main hazards with scaffolding definitely falls are number one, uh, struck by falling objects, absolutely. So uh, how are we protecting those below, blocking them from even walking under us? Um, scaffold collapse, uh, we talked a little bit about this, securing it into the structure. Uh, and electrocution, absolutely. So are we working around power lines? If so, how close are we? Can we talk, call the electrical company, have them turn things off, have them shield things? We have to have a good solid plan in place. That all comes down to pre-planning. We need to know the job before we get out there. A lot of times your employees on site, hey, go out there and do this job today. The scaffolding will be out there and they're kind of stuck in these conditions. So um, doing our due diligence up front, having a good pre-plan could definitely eliminate uh, any any um, cause for uh, major issues. Um, how are we accessing the scaffolding? So uh, definitely cannot climb the cross bracing. Um, you'll see here an end frame. Um, some of these end frames are designed for access. They'll actually have a ladder built on the side. A lot of times what we see is when they're being erected, uh, they're being flip-flopped, so they're not in a straight line up and down. So those definitely have to line up. Um, there's other ladders that attach to the scaffolding um, that you can be looking into. Maybe you're going to be using a stair tower. Maybe you're going to be using some kind of ladder securely tied off. But what is the plan? All boils down to pre-planning and having a good plan and executing it. Weather conditions huge. So um, all scaffolding, we're required to do at minimum a daily inspection. Um, also, after any major weather, uh, rainstorm, windstorm, we need to inspect the scaffolding and make sure that employees can work on it safely. If there's issues, we need to tag it out of service, um, have our uh, erectors and um, dismantlers and um, employees that know how to correct those issues go up there uh, fix the issues before the users are allowed back on. Um, and then obviously working off of ladders or buckets or that sort of thing to elevate 
um, ourselves even higher than the scaffolding, um, again, comes down to plan. We didn't have a good plan. We obviously didn't have the right kind of scaffolding if we can't reach. So things to be looking for. Um, rolling scaffolds, I know these are used a lot in the finishing trades. Uh, these prefab, prefab, buy them from a manufacturer. They come in a box, put them together. Um, after so many uses, uh, we're missing parts. We're missing the guardrails. We're missing pins. So very important to make sure when we're sending these out to the jobs or if uh, employees are keeping these on their trucks, uh, they have all the parts. And if they don't, they're ordering new parts. Um, wheels, casters, all that have to be working. They have to be able to lock. Um, you know, what does the manufacturer say? They might, they might go over and beyond OSHA. They might tell you to put the guardrails on at all times. And if you're not and someone falls, um, you know, it could drill down to uh, what did that manufacturer say? So we should be looking at uh, the safety requirements per the manufacturer on these. Um, a lot of times I see us uh, see uh, trades stacking these as well without the proper outriggers. Um, that's a recipe for disaster or they're skating on them, they're scooting on them or pulling themselves along or someone's pushing them while they're on them. Um, all very bad practices. Make sure when we're uh, moving these, um, we're moving them without anybody on them. Um, all right, let's roll right into uh, number two, uh, the duty to have fall protection. So again, this is broken down. Uh, the standard you can see uh, general uh, goes into then unprotected sides and edges, uh, hoist areas, holes, ramps, runways, other walkways, wall openings, um, protection from falling objects. This standard is a beast. What we're not gonna talk about during this webinar because it, re it applies to maybe 2% of the finishing contractors are things like leading edges or form work or excavations and roofing on low slope roofs. We're not going to get into that precast concrete. I mean, this thing is really thick. It goes on and on. We're going to focus on uh, unprotected sides and edges, hoist holes, ramps, wall openings, and uh, protection from falling objects. So. Um, in general, um, OSHA requires us to uh, make sure we have a good fall protection plan in place. Again, I'm gonna keep going back to plan. We gotta have a good plan in place at all times. Um, but per the, per the uh, standard here, um, all fall protection must conform to the criteria set out in 1926-502. So we're looking at 501. 502, I believe, was number nine on our list. So we're going to look at all that today, too. Um, additionally, um, we need to make sure that the walking, working surfaces that our employees are working on have the structural and strength, structural integrity and the strength to support those employees safely. So what is the floor loading? So sometimes we get into situations where uh, maybe it's an older floor and we're doing some work on it and it's a wood floor and what is the rating? You know, we have all these trades on it. Um, just something to be mindful of. Uh, concrete construction, you're not going to really worry about this. Concrete floors, but just something to be mindful of, okay? Um, moving on here, unprotected sides and edges. Uh, this is the most of your fall hazards are going to be from unprotected sides and edges. And each employee must be protected um, who's exposed to a fall six feet or more uh, to a lower level. How should they be protected? By guardrails, safety net systems, or personal fall arrest systems. Those are our only three options. Unprotected sides and edges, those are our only three options. We can't look at anything else. We either got to have a guardrail in place, got to have a safety net up, which is very seldomly used and not really applicable in a lot of areas, um, or fall protection, personal fall protection. So we're really kind of boiling down to two. Now in hoist areas, same thing. In hoist ways, six feet or more. Now we're now we're narrowed down just to guardrails or personal fall arrest system. So uh, we really need to know the criteria for guardrails. We really need to know the criteria for personal fall arrest systems. We really need to know that our employees understand these. They're trained and they're um, they're using this stuff appropriately. 
here's a good example of a, of a hoist area um, where we're loading material in through a window area and maybe this had some guardrails up because um, we're loading a lot of material in there and we put the guardrails up and then when the material comes take the guardrails down and load it through uh, definitely need to have personal fall arrest equipment on at this time and also what are we doing to block off the area so uh, somebody doesn't walk up behind that person and you know a distract them while they're you know just because we have personal fall arrest system on uh, doesn't mean we want to fall so we still don't want this guy to fall and also that person wouldn't be protected so we need to have good barricades behind there to make sure nobody's entering that area um, holes so the definition of a hole is a gap or void two inches or more in the least dimension. So I could have a one inch gap um, running a hundred foot down the down the floor, and OSHA doesn't consider that a hole. Once we hit two inches, though, uh, in its least direction, um, OSHA is going to consider that a hole. Uh, if they're ever on a job site, they will measure this. Very easy to measure that and uh, if it's right at two inches and it's not covered properly, um, can definitely get a citation. So it's the little things that sometimes we, we're not paying attention to that we're getting citations for. So um, anytime we have a hole uh, where there's a six foot uh, fall down to a lower level, uh, we need to have protection in place. Again, personal fall arrest systems, guardrails, or now they're adding covers to the mix. So we could use covers, right? Um, doesn't matter what the fall hazard is below, if employees could step into it or trip over it, that's also a hazard and those holes need to be covered, uh, properly. Um, and what about the employees that are walking below? Obviously if they're walking below and something can get kicked down a hole. Uh, we need to have covers in place as well. Um, so things don't fall on people. So. Uh, skylights are called out exclusively as an example in the standard. Obviously, a big issue if you're ever up on roofs and there's skylights all over the place. Recipe for disaster, um, especially if you're in a snowy area and now there's snow on top of the skylights and you didn't realize it and someone steps on it, uh, bad deal. So these need to be uh, properly covered, either guardrails around them. Here's a great example of a temporary skylight cover. Um, but again, boils down to a pre-plan, knowing the area we're going to work in before we get up there to go do our work. Uh, ramps, runways, other walkways, again, six feet or more. We're going to keep seeing that theme. OSHA gives us one option, guardrails. So they don't want people to have to hook up to a personal fall arrest system to walk uh, through this ramp or uh, walkway. So guardrail systems have to be in place. Wall openings. Um, again, if we have um, a six foot fall uh, from the outside edge down to the floor below or the ground below, um, and then the inside edge uh, to the floor we're working on is less than 39 inches, well, someone could fall over that. Uh, we'll get into criteria for uh, guardrail systems, but you know. Um, I think most people know that's 42 inches plus or minus three. So anytime you're below 39 inches, we have a fall hazard. Um, so any wall openings would then require a guardrail system, safety net, or personal fall arrest system. Again, the standard calls out specifically as an example shoots. So here's a nice picture on the left uh, with a shoot in place. And, you know, it's the shoot openings low. Someone could fall into that. That's going to be non-compliant all day. Here's a new solution. Put a guardrail up, or maybe there's a parapet wall here. The chute is raised up a little bit above 39 inches. No one can fall into the chute. Um, it's properly guarded around. So um, don't see a lot of chutes. Uh, maybe you do, but I think it's good a good example just to kind of address what they're talking about with wall openings. Um, you know, we have other wall openings like window openings. Uh, we'll see an example of that here in a little bit. Protection from falling objects. Absolutely. So em employees uh, who are exposed to uh, hazards of falling objects, just possibility that, you know, there's work going on above me, something could fall. Um, we have to require them to wear hard hats. 
and implement one of the uh, three options here. So um, we got to have hard hats on the employees, and then we also need either a tow board system um, or screen system. Uh, we need to have a canopy down below or barricade the area off. So uh, three different systems we need to try and prevent that from either falling or if it did fall, prevent it from falling on someone. And then the hard hat PPE is always our last resort. So um, that's in case it gets through the, uh, the other protective systems. All right, number three was um, respirators. So there's a lot going on with respirators. If we're using respirators, we, we need to make sure we're doing that the right way. So um, we need to have a written company policy. Uh, we need to select the right respirators based on the appropriate hazard. So what what is the stuff in the air that I am not supposed to be breathing? There's multiple different types of respirators, multiple different types of cartridges. We have to select the right ones. A lot of times we don't know what the real stuff in the air is and what cartridge to select or the proper size respirator, meaning a full face or a half mask, um, the proper type of respirator to properly protect the employee without any kind of exposure monitoring. So we have to do air monitoring. What is the exposure we're protecting the employee from? Also, employees, before they put on a respirator, they need a medical um, exam from the doctor and um, authorized to wear respirators. They need to have a fit test. They need to be properly trained. Um, they need to properly inspect and store their respirator. So a lot of requirements here, um, just naming, naming a lot of them off here just from this toolbox talk. So um, weekly toolbox talk, this would be a great one for everyone to do, right? Right away, I'm going to know, wow, we've been wearing respirators for a year and we're not doing any of this. We need, we need to report back to the supervisor and let them know that uh, we, we need a different program in place, right? Um, just a respirator hanging in the open. Uh, dirty, uh, you know, we got to store these in a, in a bag, uh, but just a respirator hanging in the open, let's say on the lunch, that could be potentially a $12,500 citation. So um, that'd be pretty silly. So that all boils down to uh, training your employees properly and then enforcing them to store them the right way. So just an example there of uh, what kind of citations could come from uh, respiratory protection. Now, dust masks, a lot of times we use dust masks as uh, a voluntary use. So, hey, we're not overexposed to anything, but we're providing these dust masks uh, so that you're more comfortable if you choose to wear them. Uh, they protect you from nuisance dust. So when you're sweeping the floor, you can throw it on voluntary use, right? Uh, which is great. Um, the thing we forget about a lot of the times is we're not having the employees review Appendix D. Right, so OSHA standard 1910-134 Appendix D, um, they need to read this, they need to sign off on it. Doing a weekly toolbox talk program with this toolbox talk in there, every year you're satisfied with that. Your new hire orientation, you have them sign off on this, every year they're gonna get it through their uh, toolbox talk program. Uh, but what are the highlights? So they need to understand the use and limitations of a dust mask, right? They can't wear this into some uh, oxygen deficient atmosphere. That's going to be a horrible situation. They can't wear it into somewhere where there's chemical hazards that they could breathe in and die, right? So nuisance dust, dust only. There's a lot of limitations to them. They need to properly wear them. So a lot of times we'll see them worn with only one strap or worn on the employees just over the mouth. So they have to cover the nose and the mouth, both straps. We can't have facial hair when we're wearing them. Even for voluntary use, you got to wear them uh, clean shaven. Uh, they need to be NIOSH rated. Um, if they don't have the NIOSH stamp on them, um, and we just picked them up from Home Depot, they don't have anything on them, they only have one strap, no NIOSH, um, you're going to get a citation. You can't wear those on, on the, in the workforce. Um, and they're disposable. Um, dust masks are disposable. Their real name is filtering face piece respirator. Um, but 
they're disposable. They're disposable dust masks. And you're not supposed to wear them all week. You're not supposed to wear them all month. You're supposed to wear them at most for that day. Sometimes maybe you're going to have two a day. Um, but when we sign Appendix D and we have a dust mask program, let's make sure that if your employees are using the rubber face piece with removable cartridges, this isn't going to comply. That's a whole nother program that we just got through talking about. All right, number four, aerial lifts. So generally, you know, these need to be designed and, construct and constructed per the ANSI standard, okay? And if we are doing any field modifications to these, which I highly recommend you don't, but maybe you own your own aerial lifts and you wanna make some field modifications because it's conducive to your work, um, you need to make sure that's uh, certified in writing by the manufacturer and also uh, up to snuff with the ANSI standards. So some specific requirements here, um, only authorized persons are allowed to operate aerial lifts. So what's an authorized person? Well, you got to train them. You got to make sure they have the proper training. Um, that training is classroom training, and you're going to understand that they understand that classroom training by testing them. And then you're going to go out and do a road test to make sure that they know how to adequately operate uh, the piece of equipment. Um, and you're going to say, okay, you're allowed to operate this type of aerial work platform because I saw you do it and you're authorized. And when one gets delivered to the job site, they're going to talk to the guy that delivers it and say, hey, give me a, um, a five to 30 minute, whatever it takes, um, kind of tour of this device because it's similar to what I was trained on, but the controls aren't actually, aren't 100% the same. So give me that familiarization training. All right. So that's familiarization training. Um, a lot of times we get confused and we think the guy that dropped it off told me how to operate it for five minutes. I'm good. Um, no, not if you haven't gone through the full blown training and, and a practical. Uh, you're not good. That's just familiarization training. So uh, make sure that you have the train, right training in place. Uh, belting off to an adjacent pole structure or equipment while working from the aerial lift shall not be permitted. Um, so this is a big one. I ran into an employee, um, actually a carpenter. He was um, doing some work on the out exterior of a high rise building. So he was on the mezzanine lab level and he had an articulating boom, uh, aerial lift kind of smaller um, unit uh, to kind of get out outside the building and kind of back in where he's working on the face of the building. Um, and he was belted off to the column strap um, that was providing at the column. And so I asked him to come down. We had a conversation and he was actually, his supervisor told him to do that because his supervisor felt that if the um, aerial lift fell off the building, that then the employee wouldn't be strapped to the aerial lift and he would dangle there and be okay. Um, so a couple concerns with that. If that were to occur, he'd probably get wrapped up in the lift. It'd snap that off and he'd go down with it anyways. But the bigger concern that I asked him is why are we, why are we thinking this thing's going to come off the building? Right. Uh, we need to have a good plan in place. If we're working with aerial lifts, these smaller units, on these floors at the edge, right? Is the cable guardrail up in place? Um, what direction is this thing? Is it is it facing the edge that if I bump the controls, it's gonna go forward and roll off? Or is it sideways that that would never happen? Uh, what kind of locks do I have in place? Can I chalk the wheels so that this thing isn't going any, anywhere? Um, is it properly rated for what I'm doing? Are we overloading it? So if we're using this thing the right way and we have a good plan in place, there's no way that any aerial lift should ever fall off of any building. So um, belting off to an adjacent polar structure is not allowed. Also think about, you know, if there were two people in that basket, someone started moving the basket and someone was belted off to adjacent structure, it could pull them out of the basket or cause damage. So um, we need to make sure that the harness and lanyard is uh on the employee and attached to the um, manufacturer's designated attachment point inside the aerial lift. 
Um, yeah, know your lift. Absolutely. Know the operator's manual. Do your pre-checks. Absolutely. Uh, what is the load capacity? Stay away from power lines. Uh, not a good mix. There's a placard right on there. It tells you how far to stay away from uh, power lines and certain voltage. If you don't know the voltage of power line and you're getting close, um, I would definitely highly recommend to stop work, shut down, don't get anywhere near it, figure out what's going on. Um, always maintain firm uh, footing on the floor, absolutely. Once we start climbing the rails of these, we're setting ourselves up for uh, for disaster. And that's obviously, if you're on an aerial lift and uh, standing on the mid rail and OSHA drives down the street and sees that, you can guarantee they're going to snipe a couple photos and there's going to be a nice citation packet heading your way. Um, and then always use the fall protection. We just talked about that. All right, moving on to five, hazard communication. And uh, hazard communication, the standard changed uh, a, a number of years ago. So this should be all up to snuff, should not be anything new, should be a quick refresher. However, last year, um, it was the fifth most cited standard. So apparently, um, we haven't really got it down uh, exactly right. So, um, you know, general gist of this is uh, the right to know also now is the right to understand. We need to understand the safety data sheets. We need to understand the labels. We have to have a, a written HASCOM program. Uh, we need to inform employees of what chemicals they're using. Uh, we need to inform them of the HASCOM program and standard. Uh, what are the safety data sheets that I'm looking at? Review them with them. Um, what is the personal pe uh, protective equipment they need? Uh, let's provide it and train them on, on the personal protective equipment. So you can just see side-by-side -side comparison, uh, old label versus new label. They look nothing alike. And um, all this had to be within compliance within June 1 of uh, 2016. Same with our material safety data sheets had to be updated to safety data sheets. Again, if you still haven't done that, you're behind the ball, I would, I would recommend you get moving on that. So uh, they didn't just change the name from material safety data sheet to safety data sheet, but the chemical manufacturers actually have to uh, evaluate the chemical, chemical a little differently. And then the safety data sheet is has to have uh, uh, these 16 sections on it in the standardized format. So section four will always be first aid measures. Um, section three will always be uh, composition. So um, where in the past, all the sections were kind of flip-flop, they're hard to follow. So uh, make sure that is up to date and you have up to date safety data sheets. Uh, on your job sites, and then the labels, right? The the old way of just buying labels and putting numbers on it, that's not gonna fly. We need to have the right labels with the pictograms and the signal word and the hazard statements and the precautionary statements on them. Where do I get these labels? Talk to your um, distributor, see if they can provide some, and the safety data sheet under section two, they provide them. Maybe you can make a copy of that print it off on labels, put it on uh, your secondary containers, whatever you need to do. Um, six, ladder safety. Um, this is a big one. Uh, we're on, up and down off of ladders all day long, and we just get really comfortable with ladders. They're kind of second nature to us, and that's when we choose to either do something silly with them or we're just not thinking, we're asleep at the wheel and something happens and uh, we fall off the ladders. And, you know, uh, I know uh, a situation where a guy fell off the third rung of the ladder and um, he had a spiral fracture uh, up his tibia and um, not, not a good situation. So he was out of work for a good year. So, um, you know, the big thing with ladder safety, select the right ladder for the job, all comes down to pre-planning, right? So if we have to access a level, we're not gonna use an A-frame and fold it up. Well, this is all I had. You can't use A-frames in the folded position. The right ladder for that job would have been an extension ladder, 
all right, I got to go do this work and it's 10 foot up and all I have is this four foot ladder. So I'm going to stand on the top of it. Again, bad pre-planning. Select the right tool for the job, including your ladders. That is a tool. Um, once we select it, we need to inspect it. We got to inspect it for damage, cracks, uh, missing feet, um, anything like that. Proper labels. Um, if, if it's damaged at all, we should not be using it. We either need to cut it up and throw it away or get it repaired. So we select, we inspect. Now we need to properly set it up and properly use it. So, uh, proper setup again, not in the folded position for A frames. Uh, your extension ladders at a four to one ratio. Um, they're secured at the top. Um, Maybe someone needs to hold the ladder at the bottom or they're secured at the bottom. We we can't let these things tip over. So um, pretty straightforward, but a common one uh, that I see a lot of shortcuts and or a lot of the sleep at the wheel and things do happen. People do fall off ladders and um, it's on OSHA's radar because it's number six. All right, number seven, uh, lead. So you're going to see some similarities if you're familiar with the new silica standard you'll see some similarities here okay uh, they pretty much frame the silica standard similar to how this lead standard is laid out uh, there's a scope and uh, if you're not sure if this pertains to you i would highly recommend going and looking at the scope lead-based paint uh, doing any retrofit around lead-based paint, you better believe that this is going to uh, apply to you. So the action level is 30 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, meaning at this point we need to take action. The PEL or permissible exposure limit is 50 micrograms per cubic meter, um, meaning this is the level that no employee is allowed to be exposed to without proper uh, respiratory protection in place. So if you if you have employees that are exposed to lead over 50 micrograms per, me, per cubic meter uh, and they don't have respirators on, uh, that's, that's a big issue. So how do you even know? Well, you have to do your exposure assessment. You have to do your personal air monitoring. Um, you need to know what the levels are for that task. And when you're doing your air monitoring, you wanna be extremely cautious and provide uh, the best respirator to the employees because the last thing you want to do is test, uh, do some personal air monitoring and find out that, hey, we're at 150 micrograms. We didn't use the right respirator. Um, where a half mask will actually cover you to up to 10 times, a uh, full face will cover you up to 50 times. So um, maybe you're at 600 micrograms, maybe you're at 1,000 and you only provide that person with a half mask, uh, now you have that on record and OSHA finds out about it and they're gonna say you overexposed your employee. So you need to make sure that you have a good plan in place. Again, all comes down to planning. Um, so methods of compliance. Yeah, we need, if, if we have anything that's over the action level, we need to have some engineering controls in place, some uh, ventilation in place, we got to do something. We got to continue to drive the level down however we can. Uh, respiratory protection, that has to be up to snuff. Uh, protective clothing and equipment, um, that is uh, uh, a big point for lead. Uh, you won't see protective clothing uh, and equipment for the silica standard, nor will you see hygiene facilities, but that's a big deal for lead. All right, so we got to have the right PPE. Um, that PPE has to then stay at the facility, uh, get bagged up properly, get disposed of properly. Employees have to have a place to clean because lead, we could bring that home to our family, wash it in the washer and dryer uh, with our families, and they're getting uh, lead exposure as well, where silica, that's not the case. That's mainly, it's a dust in the air, you breathe it, it's bad for you. Um, but if it's on your clothes and it gets washed, it pretty much turns to the mud and uh, no one's going to be exposed. Lead's a, a different story. Uh, there's housekeeping requirements, medical surveillance requirements, meaning if you have employees that are exposed over the action level or over the PEL, and even though they're wearing respirators, we need to have a kind of a baseline 
this is their lead levels and then check them every now and then because, you know, the PPE is only as good as the person who's donning it and maybe they're not wearing it right and uh, their lead levels are rising or maybe for some reason they're not, you know, washing their hands before lunch and they're eating their sandwich and their lead levels are rising. We want to catch that uh, before it's an issue. Um, communication, we got to have the right training, the right signs in place, the right record keeping, and uh, understand who can ob observe uh, our air monitoring efforts. So that is a, that is a big program there. Uh, if you're working with lead, um, I, would, I would suspect that you have that under control. You have someone that is your you know, go-to person on that and all your, all your employees are trained. However, if you're working with lead and any of that sounds foreign or you're not too sure, um, that's something you really need to dig into. Uh, that's a big deal. Uh, number eight, training requirements for scaffolding and fall protection. So we hit scaffolding pretty hard. We hit fall protection pretty hard. Um, you know, OSHA comes out and, hey, it's not right on site. Next thing they're gonna ask is, let me see your program. Let me see your training. Let me see this, let me see that. Oh yeah, we don't have a program. Oh yeah, we didn't train anyone. So now you're now you could potentially get multiple violations uh, for one inspection and the penalty could be increasing. Uh, so for scaffolding, we have a couple different kind of workers, right? So employees who perform work on the scaffolding. So your users of scaffolding, they need to be trained by a qualified person in the subject matter. Um, so if you have a user of a swing stage, that's completely different training than a user of a supported scaffold or a rolling scaffold. So they got to be trained in the scaffolding area that they're going to be using. Employees involved with erection, dismantling, moving, operating, repairing, maintaining, or inspecting, they need to be trained by a competent person. Again, what are they, what? What kind of uh, scaffolding are they moving? Moving a swing stage is a whole different um, procedure than moving uh, supported scaffolding. So there's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration for for both, but they're totally different. Uh, so they need to have proper training. And anytime uh, the employer has reason to believe, so it's up to you that employee lacks the skill or understanding, then you need to retrain them. Um, you need to retrain them. So for any reason, so you go out to a job site and they're working on a scaffolding without the proper fall protection. I would say that's reason to retrain them. They should know that. They were trained that the fall protection needs to be up or we weren't inspecting it. Well, who's supposed to be inspecting this? We need to retrain that person. So there's a lot of things there that um, could equate to retraining, uh, near misses, incidents. For fall protection, um, we need to train each employee who might be exposed to fall hazards. And in construction, that might be everybody, okay? Uh, I don't think you can get around it. If you're on a job site and they have guardrails up, they're exposed to fall hazards. If that guardrail isn't installed the right way or is damaged, they're exposed to a fall hazard. They need to recognize what's the right way that this guardrail should look, right? It looks a little low to me or the section's missing um, or there's holes out here and they're not covered, but they look small enough to me. I can't fall down them. They're only four inches. Well, we know that that's not right. So they weren't trained properly. They don't know that a hole, according to OSHA, is two inches or greater in the least dimension. So that person our employees need to be trained by someone who's competent in fall protection, okay? So it can't just be, uh, hey, we got to train you guys and uh, here's some stuff and uh, hope you're good, right? That person has to be competent in fall protection and we need to train the employees so they understand. We need to certify that training. So that's a, rec a written certification record and we need to retrain any employees. Again, if you have reason to believe, you as the employer, um, that an employee doesn't understand um, whatever it is pertaining to fall protection, like they're not wearing their harness the right way because the D-ring's all the way 
down to their lower back or the leg straps aren't even fastened or they're attaching two lanyards to each other, right? You have reason to believe they need to be retrained, then they need to be retrained. Um, so rolling into number nine here, uh, almost done. Uh, this is 502, the fall protection systems and criteria. So OSHA not only says you have the duty pro to provide this fall protection, they're going to tell you, well, you could choose between the guardrail, safety net, or personal fall arrest systems. And when you choose guardrail, it must comply to this, right? So we'll look at those. We're not going to look at, you know, positioning device, warning lines, controlled access zones. If you want more information into that, you think that would help you, um, we can dig into that later offline, hit up the safety helpline. But for most people on this call, it's not even going to uh, concern them. So generally, um, you know, the, the systems have to uh, comply to the standard, right? They're just going to throw that out there, um, 502A1. And so if, if you weren't, they could just cite you on that, which that's a pretty scary citation because under there is all the criteria. So if, it, if you ever got cited on that, why is that scary? Because you could repeat that easily where it was specifically my guardrail was too low, I want to be cited on that standard because it's going to be harder to repeat just that than repeat the whole standard. And 502A1 is pretty much the whole standard. You know, you need to comply to this is what it's saying. So something to pay attention to if you ever do receive a citation. Um, 502A2, um, you need to provide and install fault protection systems required uh, before the employee begins work. So that's that's a big deal, right? Oh, we were going to get to it tomorrow. No, too late. Uh, the employee's out here working. They're exposed. They didn't have the right fall protection, whether they, you know, we didn't have the guardrail up or they didn't have the harness and lanyard. It's too late. They need to have it before. Again, we'll go back to pre-planning. Um, so guardrails, top rails, 42 inches plus or minus three. 200 pounds of force in the outward and downward direction. So if they can't take that 200 pounds of force, and I would not test that by running into the guardrail, right? It has to be constructed in a strong way that it's, you know, if you can go up to it and the thing's wobbling, you know that's not going to support 200 pounds. Uh, mid rails, midway between the top and the working surface. Uh, again, force 500, uh, 150 pounds outward and downward direction. Um, just think of that one. If someone were to fall, they're going to fall out and down. Um, sometimes you can get away with not having a mid rail. If you have like intermediate members, as you see on the left, there's this knee wall, um, and it's being framed up and it has intermediate members. So these two by fours are, um, on center, um, either 19 inches or probably less than that apart. And so they don't need to throw a mid rail up there. Um, so if you have intermediate members that are 19 inches um, or less, so if they were 18 inches or 12 inches apart, then you're good. No one's going to fall through there. You don't need a mid rail. You can see on the right here, window opening, right? Less than 39 inches. So I have to add my top rail. The window sill, if it's at 21 inches, you're great. Um, if it's below that, where it's below the midway point, uh, you might have to also add a mid rail. So something to be looking for. Um, cable guardrails, um, they cannot sag lower than 39 inches. So when I put that 200 pounds of force on there, if they're sagging um, below 39 inches, we have an issue. Or even better, a lot of times you'll be in a job site and they'll already just be sagging down to 32 inches with no one touching them. That's an issue. And they must be flagged. Uh, every six feet for visibility, either tie in danger tape on them or, you know, construction netting, meshing, uh, that's flagged for visibility. That's definitely uh, the full thing. So that would work. Parapet walls, again, same thing. Um, if they're lower than the guardrail standard on the right here, you see a good example of a guardrail system on a parapet wall. Safety netting. Um, we're not going to get into this very much. Just know that there's very specific requirements for this, the size of the mesh, 
um, the connections, uh, they need a drop test. Um, so there's a lot to these. You don't see them very often, but if you're utilizing them, really need to dig in and make sure that you're compliant here. Personal fall arrest systems, uh, this is a big one. Very, very specific requirements. Uh, gotta have a full system, anchor point, body harness, connector, the right system for the right situation you're in. All comes down to, again, pre-planning. Have to be properly maintained and inspected before use. Need to be properly set up. Need to have a rescue plan, very important. Um, last thing you wanna do is have a bad system in place. Someone falls and they still hit the ground. You can see from the calculation on the right, you know, this individual, they're actually gonna go down about um, 17 feet below the level uh, that they're at. Um, okay, maybe, uh, maybe 12 feet. Um, so if you have someone in this situation tied off and it's a six foot fall, they're gonna be hitting the ground. So maybe a better option would be a retractable than a six inch lanyard. Um, anchor points, 5,000 pound anchor point per employee. Um, systems, again, needs to be designed, planned out. You see a lot of different systems um, here with the uh, horizontal lifelines, vertical lifelines, retractables, uh, a re roof unit, um, an anchor. Um, just want to point out here, again, you know, inspection is very critical, and then rescue. Uh, have to have a rescue plan. If that person falls, how are we getting them down? We're using this boom lift. We're using this ladder. We're using, what are we doing? We have to have a way to get them down. Um, covers need to be capable of supporting without failure twice its intended load. So if there's gonna be a scissor lift rolling over it, that thing better be pretty hefty, or maybe we're putting guardrails around that whole cover so no one rides a scissor lift over it. They need to be secured down so someone doesn't accidentally pick it up and walk away with it or it doesn't get blown off. They need to be marked whole or covered. Uh, tow boards for uh, falling object protection uh, need to be at least three and a half inches uh, high uh, without more than a quarter inch off the work walking working surface and no more than an inch gap um, as you're going along them. Uh, 50 pounds, need to support 50 pounds. Number 10, uh, final one on our uh, OSHA top 10. Uh, and then we'll be wrapping up here as eye and face safety. Um, so very important uh, safety require safety glasses per OSHA are required whenever eye hazards exist. In construction, I could probably make an argument that eye hazards always exist. Most general contractors are saying 100% safety glasses now. Most subcontractors are saying 100% safety glasses now. Um, if you're not, maybe it's time to get on board. Um, wear them all the time. No questions asked. We don't have to worry about it. All right. So, um, but when we're wearing them, we have to wear them properly. We have to wear the right safety glasses. Uh, we have to use, um, you know, just some fancy sunglasses that someone brings in that say Oakley on them. And they say, you know, uh, I promise they're, they're, they're better than safety glasses. Well, um, they need to prove it and it's pretty easy. So there's markings on the side. We'll see that in a little bit. Uh, face shields are required whenever we're grinding or using power saws. Anytime abrasives could fly into our face and the safety glasses are still required under the face shield. So we can't take those off. Maybe we need tinted face shields, um, per torch cutting or, you know, welding hoods, right? Um, some different things to, to take into consideration there. So, um, yeah, safety glasses, they need to be rated. They're rated by ANSI. Um, they need to have a marking of Z87 on the inside of the, um, of the glasses. And what this marking is telling you is that it's strong enough to withstand a quarter inch steel ball traveling 150 feet per second. Okay, that's what these are tested at. So your regular safe, uh, your regular prescription glasses, your regular Sunglasses from the gas station, those aren't those are gonna shatter. Um, things are gonna get through those. They're not they're not gonna work. So let's make sure we have the right uh, safety glasses. If you have employees with prescription, um, 
They uh, can go and request prescription lenses. Uh, safety glasses also need to have side guarding, so they can either snap on side shields or get special uh, prescription glasses with uh, the right lenses with side shield shielding already in place. Um, so that's it for our top 10. So just a reminder here, you saw some of these toolbox talks. Uh, they have a lot of information packed into them, a lot of information that you can use to train your employees to keep drilling in the safety on a weekly basis, a new topic. How does this relate to us? What are we not doing right? What can we get better at? That could be a Monday morning, should be a Monday morning thing. Shake the weekend cobwebs out. Get your head back in the game. Let's uh, let's think safety here uh, before we start our week. Um, so that's available to you guys. Again, over 200 of them. And again, if you have any questions um, today pertaining to this webinar, if you'd like a copy of the webinar, um, if you have any questions moving forward the next week, two, um, the next quarter, next next year, whatever it is, whatever comes up, feel free to call the safety helpline or shoot us an email uh, and we'll get back to you and um, get you a response and try to get you um, lined up in the right direction so that uh, your employees are going home at the end of the day and uh, you're not getting OSHA citations. So I wanna thank everyone for their time today and look forward to seeing everyone back next quarter. Um, have a great one, thank you.